I'll start off. And uh, my co-presenter, Tess, and I have collaborated together with a lot of other folks uh, with Vestas to design and build a cloud-native, sustainable, high-performance compute solution on Azure using .NET. That was a long sentence. Um, and just to give you a brief intro to what Vestas is and why it's so complex, Vestas is the largest wind turbine manufacturer in the world. They're also the most sustainable energy company in the world. Um, they design and build these huge turbines, each capable of producing enough electricity to power 20,000 homes. At normal operation, the wingtip of a blade travels, meaning a blade, what you're seeing on the screen right now, uh, travels faster than any race car. In fact, and it and must operate with as little, as little maintenance as possible for the 30-year-plus 30, 30 lifespan of a, of a turbine. Um, these, these wind turbines are gigantic, uh, and so is the compute power needed to execute the simulations. So we simulated loads of the individual components of each wind turbine over the entire lifespan. We figured out the optimal placements of turbines in a wind farm. We calculated structural optimization of a turbine depending on where you located the turbine. There's a huge difference between a turbine located at sea, located at sea or inland. There's not that many wind gusts. So there's many metric tons of savings on steel, for instance. Um, Vestas has been doing this for quite a, a number of years and had and, and what at a point where they had to re build their solutions and they need to figure out whether, whether or not they want to stay on premise or move their um, new workload to the cloud. So we, together with Vestas, collaborated on, on, on this project. And uh, we, if we distill the requirements down to what we're talking about today, it, it is about scale. And it needs to scale really, really big, like 400,000 cores was our scale target. That's a lot of cores. It, of course, needed to be cost efficient. Uh, it didn't matter to move to the cloud if it was twice as expensive. Uh, and last but not least, they want it to be as green as possible. Vestas wanted to keep being number one energy company or most sustainable energy company in the world. And that brings us to, to carbon, uh, generally, or carbon emissions, because the IT industry, meaning our industry, emits more carbon emissions than the aviation industry. In fact, IT industry emits almost twice as much as the, as the entire aviation industry. So what can we do about this? And, and in collaboration with Green Software Foundation, um, Green Software Foundation have created these green software principles. They categorized into these three categories. There's energy, effici energy efficiency, uh, actions taken to make software use less electricity, electricity to perform the same function, such as, let's say, um, software optimization or, or choosing a more efficient programming language. Um, one note here is, of, of course, that's not the only thing you should optimize for. In my opinion, at least, you should be optimized for developers and delivery. But if you're running at 400,000 core scale, um, you should probably consider the language also. Um, hardware efficiency, uh, actions taking to making software use fewer physical resources to perform the same function, such as uh, VM right sizing. Um, Azure Advisor, for instance, helps you guide uh, guides you if you if you provision a too too large a VM. It's, it'll tell you you never really use this resource to scale down. There's also energy efficient hardware, um, choosing the right processor architecture. X86 is the default standard for most, um, but if you Going on to ARM processors, they're way more efficient as they don't have all the legacy instructions. And .NET runs on ARM, so that's not a problem either. Um, you can also turn on or turn off unused resources. In, in our case, uh, our, the cluster could scale from zero cores to two hundred four to four hundred thousand cores, or down to zero again if you wanted to. Um, Azure has great capabilities of, of that with many of the managed services too, such as um, Azure Web Apps or containers, um, container apps. And then the last one, carbon awareness. Um, actions you can take to, to run computations using lower carbon sources of electricity. And I need to help you translate that a little bit. But, but it basically means you can move workload 
a later in the day where the electricity is screener or cheaper, if that's what you prefer, or you can even move um, to, to another location. So let me show you what I mean by that. So I'm going to jump over to my browser here, and I have a, an app or a website called that Electricity Map. That's actually one of them we also collaborated with. They right now, what I've set it up to now, it shows live data of the, let's say, the greenness of electricity right now. So let's zoom in a little bit to Europe. That's why I'm located. Um, so if you look at Europe, and let's take uh, the Netherlands, for instance. The Netherlands is where we have the West Europe Asia region located. And the carbon intensity right now is 331 grams. And that means requires uh, the electricity mix of the electricity um, to pr produce a kilowatt of hour is admitted. Uh, 331 grams of, of, of carbon is emitted. And if, uh, if we drill down a little bit more here, you can actually see it's mostly solar and lots of gas and a little bit of coal that they are uh, using right now. So if you if you consider it, how it's been previously, if, if if for instance if you had a workload you knew to have gonna run for an hour, when is this the most ideal situation to to run this? It's probably been last night, as you can see here, as the carbon intensity is 170 ish, um, but it's definitely not this morning where it's with like more than 500. So if you can move your workload around in that period of time, that would be great. The other thing you can do that was time shifting. Uh, the other thing you do is, is uh, um, location shifting. And what we did also in this solution, we did location shift, and we could do it in many locations. But let's pick another one, uh, Sweden. Um, Sweden, uh, South Central Sweden is this region called. That's actually where we have the Swedish Central, Central Sweden Central Asia region. And you can see here that their energy mix is a lot different. They have mostly nuclear, lots of hydro, and a little bit of wind today. It's so late already here in the north, so there's not much so, uh, solar left. But just by moving your workload from this region to this region, you could save like what is that, 70, 80 percent carbon. Um, that's quite quite a high number. All right, let me get back to my slides here. So to, before I hand it over to Tess, I want to show you a little bit about what we did in the back end. So this is the admin uh, user interface where, um, where the, 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 the owners of the system sort of con control a lot of things. And one of the things they can control is how green the solution was versus the cost. Because it might occur a cost moving data from, from, let's say, Western Europe to Sweden Central. There's a cost of moving the data over there. So uh, moving the data to, or sorry, moving the workload and hence also moving the data uh, incurred a cost, but you'll save a lot of carbon. But that not might be the ideal situation for them all the time and how much extra cost. And that's what they can control here. So we have these uh, leaves here. There's three small leaves and a, and a, a and, and a single leaf on the one side. So you can sort of control how green you want to be and how much dollars you want to spend or, or euros you want to spend on, on the second slider. So you can move that slider back and forth. And then to make it more, a little bit more clear uh, for the users, we sort of, you can see we have this nice picture of turbines and a sea with green. But if you move the slider a little bit further, less green, we sort of change it into, it ends up being sort of a cesspool with garbage and a bottle there just to make it a little bit fun and notch the people. Another thing we did here is actually this small section here. We could, as we gathered all the data, we knew how much carbon they would save, how much extra money they, they spend. Um, and so we could notch people by saying, okay, if you last 30 days, for instance, if you change that slider one notch to become more green, or you want to spend a little bit extra money, you could have saved, uh, Inventing numbers here, you could, by spending an additional thousand dollars, you could have saved 17% 17, 17 CO2 or similar. And then, of course, there was a lot of other things here in this admin interface. This was built in uh, in Blazor because we all had to, the most of the crew was actually uh, um, .NET developers, so that was kind of simple for us to do. But let's uh, hand over to Tess that. So she can give us a little bit more detail of how we did each of these things. 
Right. So um, Anders was talking about what's possible theoretically, and I'm going to um, uh, talk a little bit more about how we actually did it um, in this in this project. So um, looking at the requirements that Anders was talking about, a few things that stick out and that I just want to mention is that 400 cores, if you want to appreciate that scale, we actually had to go and talk to and the individual data centers to see if they actually had 400 cores available. So that's a lot of cores, I wouldn't say. Um, but taking it down to a little bit more detailed um, requirements and, and also some requirements that actually matter for our choices of making it green. Um, one simulation, um, now kind of like mix simulation and job. Um, uh, one simulation has around 10 to 20,000 tasks. And, and obviously, if we run a few of them together, that's what makes up the 400,000 cores. Each one of these tasks take about three minutes. Um, and this three minutes is very a very useful number to keep track of when we make a choice of what compute to use. And all of these tasks do a lot of data reads. So what they do is Monte Carlo simulations, but they go in and read the input data at very high frequency. So that makes a difference for how you can think about either uh, mapping um, a drive or copying data over. And finally, a few um, other requirements was that the users, because they were used to working on this on-prem cloud solution, that was a weird sentence, but their current uh, HPC solution, uh, there they could access the files as if they were local to their machines and they wanted the same experience when we moved to, to Azure as well. And finally, it should be easy to observe. So they wanted to be able to see if, um, you know, how far along in the simulations they were. And also if something, if something is going wrong, they want to know what they can do about it to fix it. So in order to do, in order to create a system like this, we need an HPC solution. And, and a really good HPC solution for Azure is Azure Batch. So this is uh, Azure Batch. And in this case, um, Azure Batch, what it does is you can send it a large number of jobs or, or jobs, and it will uh, go through and take all of the tasks in each of these jobs and send them out to different nodes. It also takes care of scaling. When I say nodes, I mean uh, VMs. Um, it also takes care of scaling. So of course, like Anders was talking about, scaling is a, is a very useful thing when it comes to greenness because we wanna make sure that we're utilizing as little compute as possible for the tasks that we wanna do. And a few other things that um, having this job run on batch versus, for example, running it on-prem allows us to do is we can right size, we'll call it like that, um, the VMs. So we can pick the smallest VM size possible for doing this particular job. We can also make a choice between what we call dedicated nodes and spot low priority nodes. So spot nodes um, are kind of leftover from someone else's dedicated nodes. So you can choose to say, if you want to um, actually have Azure um, request a set of nodes and dedicate them specifically to you, or take someone else's unused ones. The benefit of this when it comes to greenness is that um, a data center like Azure can fully utilize all the machines that they have because they give away things that are not in use at the moment. Um, the benefit to you is that you pay a lot less for spot nodes. So you might pay like a reduction of maybe 90% of the price of a dedicated node. Of course, there's no such thing as a free lunch. So what you, what you give up in return is that you don't know if you're going to get a node and you also don't know if you're going to keep the node throughout the whole task. So if you have a long task and you get evicted, that's a bad thing because you, keep, you have to constantly keep state. Whereas in our case, because we had three minute tasks, it didn't matter if uh, we were evicted. We could just resend the task again, get a new spot node and move on. So this was an excellent case for, for cost saving um, through spot nodes. Um, it come, uh, something else that was even better uh, for 
greenness was what Anders was talking about in terms of location and time shifting. So for us, that meant that we had a number of different Azure batch accounts in different regions. So for example, in Sweden and West Europe, um, and um, we could have, if we if we would have known that we would fit, we could have only picked Sweden because Sweden is is generally a very green location compared to many of the other locations where we have Azure data centers. But because we're uh, running at such scale, we need to make sure that we can we can send jobs to different locations if we kind of fill up uh, one data center. So. Uh, what we did is we created a, an Azure function, which we called the dispatcher, that went out and asked two different APIs. One of the APIs we called the CO2 API, and one is the cost API. And we ask the CO2 API um, for what's the CO2 emissions right now in these locations, and which one of the locations is better for us to send um, to send our jobs to, and also. It gives us a forecast so we can also make sure we understand when we can send the jobs. The other thing we ask is the cost API, which is a natural API. I'll show what these APIs are in a second. And these two together allows us to decide sort of where and when to send them based both on cost and CO2. The dispatcher makes that choice. Um, for the CO2 emissions, Anders has already shown you the electricity map. So the electricity map is a site that has an API and you're, you can use this, it will give you forecasts and so forth. Built on top of this, uh, the Green Software Foundation that Anders was talking about earlier built another SDK, another API uh, called the Carbon Aware SDK. So what this allows you to do, um, what this allows you to do is you can send in a number of location and it will prioritize them and also give back when would be a good time uh, to utilize them. We have, on top of this, enhanced the Carbon Aware SDK uh, to also be able to give uh, cost versus carbon uh, information. So select both based on cost and carbon um, based on the formula that we came up with. The cost API is the Azure Retail, retail Prices API that gives us back information about what a dedicated node and what a spot node costs in different data centers and also forecast of these. So all of that together allows us to make the choice. Now, I did also mention that the users want to see the uh, files as if they were local. So for this, we use Azure files, file shares uh, so they can map them to the drive. But uh, if you recall, I also mentioned that each task makes a lot of reads to the files. And this turned out to be a little bit of a problem for us at this scale because we had so many reads that we were kind of um, overuse or it would be too much for just mapping a file share. So mapping a file share is one of the ways that the Azure batch node can get data. The second way it can get data is if we actually copy files to the node through resource files. So this is what we ended up doing. Um, we created some Azure blob storage, uh, called them satellite storage, in the same regions as the Azure batch account so that we had local data. And then um, we would send them in as reference files, so or send them in as resource files. So Azure batch would then copy them over to the nodes as the tasks started and copy data back when the tasks are, were finished. Um, then on the way back, um, Initially, what we would do it would be to copy the data back once the job was done. But this could take so long and mean that we would copy a lot of files at once. So instead, what we ended up doing is uh, have another Azure function that we call the blob trigger, and that would, based on an event grid of the events um, blob created, uh, trigger and send the data back automatically to the artifact storage. So for the users, they would see the data coming back as soon as the tasks were ready with them, um, making it very much feel the same as when they were doing their on-prem solution. Now, this turned out to be a little bit of a problem for us too, because there was such a massive scale of files to copy back 
Um, so we had to come up with a good scaling mechanism for the blob trigger. But just uh, with an Azure function that's like a serverless um, function, it's it's very easy to scale up and down versus if this would have been on their own system. Um, now, to complete the picture, we have a few other components of the system. So the DC client is, an, is a client application that lives on the client's machine. Um, this, in turn, sends data off to an API. In this case, we use .NET minimal APIs, ASP.NET minimal APIs, um, sending it off to an Azure queue. Um, I think the previous speaker spoke about kind of creating these elastic um, systems. So sending it off to a queue so that in case the dispatcher was already busy, um, it would just wait and pick it up as soon as it was done. Um, now, I want to mention something about uh, minimal APIs because this is a question I get, or I've gotten uh, quite a few times. Um, and the question was, can you really use minimal APIs for real systems? Um, some people think, tend to think that they can only be used for toy systems, which is, uh, at least in my opinion, very wrong. Uh, we constantly use minimal APIs for things like this, and we even created, or I created a a blog post um, that you can read on how we organize these ASP.NET Core minimal APIs uh, for production systems in, you know, um, in production <laughs> ways. Um, the last thing I want to mention here about the system is that we also had a requirement around observability. Um, so when you work in Azure, it's very easy to achieve observability using app insights and add app insights and logging into all your systems and also to, to Azure Batch. Um, and then tack on something, for example, like Grafana to see all the logs and, and all the measurements. Um, and Anders was also mentioning that we built a cloud burst monitor um, in Blazor that, that also actually incorporated these Grafana views. Um, but good thing about this was uh, using a Blazor app or writing a Blazor app was very, very easy for, for the whole crew since we were most, most of us were uh, already .NET developers and also um, the people at Vestas uh, had worked with .NET uh, for most of the time. So it was easy for us to create something where we could sort of show all the jobs and all the statuses and the details in a way that was also kind of familiar to them from Azure Batch through using um, the Office UI um, components. So we definitely recommend it for, for a system like this where you have um, in-house users and you have a lot of developers that already know ASP.NET or .NET. So that is the whole um, system. Uh, if you want to know more about this and read more about sort of the details of what we did, um, feel free to scan the QR code or go to AKMS slash saving CO2, where we blogged about the whole system and the choices we made. And finally, I just want to mention a few results and takeaways. So by um, time shifting, we we figured out that we actually made a reduction during a day of 12 to 16 percent uh, carbon emissions, and by the location shifting, we could make a reduction of 30 to 90 percent. I know Anders already showed this in in his slides, but this is a significant amount if you have kind of like heavy workloads in in the cloud, and even if you don't want to move things around, um, if you don't have the problem that we had where you wouldn't necessarily uh, always fit in one data center. You can just pick one of the, the ones with uh, greener energy, some more renewable energy or nuclear nuclear to, um, to reduce a lot of your CO2 emissions off the bat. Um, so I think we're out of time, but uh, if there are any questions, uh, I think we're happy to take them. Yes, there are. This was absolutely amazing. I am just super excited by this. Uh, just the concept of too. developing greener, like that's that's kind of interesting. So we do have a question from 
Jeremy Sinclair, one of our live watchers on YouTube. He's saying just like holistically, you know, how can we code greener as .NET developers? Like, especially for like enterprise devs, because, you know, typically they're involved with huge applications. Like what steps can they take? There are quite a few steps. First of all, we're lucky that .NET is actually quite an efficient language. And I know Tess likes Python, so I can toy a little bit with her. Python <laughs> is not very efficient. <laughs> so sorry about that. Not to throw Tess under the bus, but Python exactly. is there. <laughs> <laughs> but she also likes .NET, so that's a good thing. Oh, that's funny. <laughs> no, awesome. but, uh, but there are lots of things you can do. Programming efficiency is, of course, a thing, but actually it's the way you host it. Like Tess mentioned, if you if you pick a region, Azure region, for instance, that, mm -hmm. that is green or you've done quite a bit, but you're also scaling up and down the resources. You don't, like, don't provision the biggest servers you can find just because it's cool. Um, only use whatever you need. I think that's probably one of the biggest impact you can have um, on, on building solutions like this. And of course, yeah, efficiency, right? It's always a thing. Awesome. Um, yeah, and the other thing was there was a few shout outs with Tess's icons and like the drawing-esque style of like the, the slides and icons. And Jeremy's like, uh, we need to have Tess do that for all of our- Yeah, I, I, I need to know how those were how, how those were done. Or did you hand draw those, Tess? Yes. That's awesome. Yeah, are are That's you so cool. available for commissions? <laughs> I'm working on some, some videos right now. <laughs> Mm, let's yes. talk afterwards. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So well, actually, go ahead. Oh, so I'm just going to say, Tess is actually trying to help me become better at drawing like that, but I'm <laughs> still not at her level. But we do uh, all our uh, architecture drawings like that. <laughs> yeah. That's amazing. I love mm -hmm. it. Well, kudos for that. Um, and uh, we're going to say goodbye for now to Anders and Tess. Thank you so much for being on. Thank this you. was amazing. Um, so uh, be sure we to... We appreciate it. Thank you yeah, so much. Thank you. All right. Take care.